All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Ann Arbor District Library for our Ann Arbor Comic and Arts Festival. We're so excited to have Caldecott Medal winning comic artist and author Dan Santat here with us all the way from California. Yes. Yes, let's, let's give him a round of applause as we are all welcoming him as he's talking about how he gains his inspiration for his books and for all of his art. Let's welcome Dan Santat. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in Arbor, Michigan. So, so delightful. Um, thank you for coming out. Uh, I've been in this business for about 19 years and still to this day, I'm always worried is anybody gonna show up? So it's always nice to have people show up. Thank you very much. Um, now, I only have an hour to talk about my inspiration and I've done over 120 books for kids throughout my career. So I'm just gonna pick a handful of titles that uh, some of you will probably be very familiar with um, and some that you probably don't even remember because they were so long ago. But uh, it'll probably give you a pretty good insight into my way of thinking and you know, some maybe maybe touch a couple of souls a little bit. You know, talking about the inspiration behind some of these ideas. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is a title that I did with Mac Barnett called "Oh No" or "How My Science Project Destroyed the World." Show of hands, who even knows this title? Anybody familiar with this? Yeah, this one came out way back, like yeah, way back in the early 2000s, uh, back when uh, no one really knew who Mac Barnett was. I think this was maybe his second or third book, and I was blessed with being able to work with him. I mean, now I think if this book came out again and was like, hey, there's a book with Mac Barnett, illustrated by Dan Santat, um, I, think, I think it would have sold. <laughs> I think it would have sold a little bit better than it did. Um, you can still find it, uh, but it was this great manuscript that uh, he wrote. And I remember reading the manuscript, and it was only, I want to say it was only like 127 words. And what I find inspiring is that when I work with other authors, I take it as a learning opportunity. And uh, I wasn't very comfortable being a writer. I was more, I, was, I, I felt more confident uh, as an illustrator. And so uh, the reason why you see me working with a lot of other authors is because I think, I think it's just a great opportunity to learn from someone else. Um, so this story, um, was, gosh, I want to say it was published in like 2007, 2008. And it was at this point where I was running all over the place. I had, I had a lot of things on my plate. Uh, I was working full time at a video game company, Treyarch, uh, and we had just finished up uh, Call of Duty Black Ops, like the very first Call of Duty game. And I was working there as a concept artist and environment artist. Um, simultaneously, I also had a cartoon show on the Disney Channel called The Replacements. And what's crazy about having your own cartoon show uh, while having a full-time job at a video game company is this, it's just this big tower of insecurity that you have because you're thinking like, well, what if the show gets canceled? I have to have a steady nine to five, right? And you know, when I reflect on it, it was really silly. Um, and so while I wasn't working at the game company or working at Disney, uh, I, would, I would illustrate picture books <laughs> as well, and it was some rough years where, you know, on, on average, I would sleep maybe six hours a night. I'd go to bed at three in the morning, wake up at 9 a.m., and then do the whole thing over again. And then you'd have a kid, you have a kid, and then, of course, kids don't sleep through the night when they're very young, and so you'd wake up two, three times a night. And I remember getting to a point where I almost fell asleep on the steering wheel. Actually, I did, I coasted a little bit, but LA traffic prevented me from going high speeds, but I had missed my exit, and I was still, I was still in my lane, and I realized I need, to, I need to slow down a little bit. And so I left the game company, and then I left Disney after the first season of The Replacements, and then I had nothing else on my plate, and all I had was this project. And I, I remember telling myself, this is the first opportunity that I will have where I can dedicate and commit my full attention on a book project, because other than that, I was just spread out all over the place doing all different kinds of jobs. And it was important for me to just put all my love and attention into this project, because I wanted the publishing industry to say like, let's give this guy more work. And so I just poured my heart into it. And, and one of the things that I, I really stress when I'm working on a project, 
which I find is not actually common practice with a lot of people is meet your deadlines. It's, it's surprising when I talk to a lot of other book creators or authors or illustrators especially where they just, they just steam, steamroll through their, their deadlines. And um, I don't know, I just, it, there's this level of professionalism that I have to maintain. Uh, and, and, and the other part was, um, you know, I didn't feel like I had an opportunity to really show anybody what I could really do in books. And so I had this great, I had this great art director who basically was hands off with me because I don't think they were expecting much from this book and just said, you know, you take this as far as you want, but if you go too far, I'll pull you back. And, and if there's any illustrators out there that, that uh, want to work or, or are doing books right now, I think that's a really great way to approach uh, your career is just give more than what is expected and then you'll be hired for more work. And so, oh no, or how my science project destroyed the world in summary is about a little girl who builds um, a giant robot for the science fair and it, and it escapes and it starts terrorizing the city. Uh, one, little, one little Easter egg here, because I cover my book filled with Easter eggs. Uh, what here, lower right hand corner, there's the um, Cup of Dirt, the Science Fair Project, Cup of Dirt. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Brian Regan's uh, comedy bit about Cup of Dirt making a Science Fair Project at the last minute, famous bit of his. Um, it turned out that maybe five years ago, someone had found this in a library, saw the cup of dirt, and then tweeted at Brian Regan and said, oh my gosh, cup of dirt made it into a book. And then Brian Regan uh, tweet, tweeted me and said, appreciate, appreciate the uh, Easter egg. Um, so this giant robot escapes the science fair and is terrorizing the city and the girl has to fix this situation. So she goes home, grabs a frog, grows a giant big frog with a, a growth ray in her garage. They, they, they face off, tax, tax the, the robot, saves the city. Um, now, in, in design, there, there's, this, is a, this is a phrase that you hear more in, in graphic design and more industrial design, furniture design and product design and things like that, but the, the phrase is form follows function where you wanna be intuitive in your decisions of, of design, where it feels like the design itself lends to the functionality of, of the project. And in this particular case, it just really felt like a, like a kaiju, you know, monster, monster film. And I was a huge fan of those movies growing up as a kid, right? So I took that opportunity to take this project and frame it in such a way that it felt like that. Um, and so, you know, a couple things that I want to show you is you take off the dust jacket and it looks like, it looks like a horizontal uh, movie poster that you see, you see in, in Asia, like you'll see them, um, you know, billboards, you know, in the streets. And I, I did a different approach with the uh, author and illustrator photos rather than just like a cute photo. Uh, it was, it's us running away from the monster. Um, <laughs> The, you'll, see the, you'll see the little speech bubble coming out of the robot's mouth. That's where the QR code, that's where the barcode goes in when you want to buy the book. Um, little, little things like that. Um, yeah, and then, and then one particular thing that I, that I did throughout the entire book, the illustration style, I wanted it to feel like an old movie frame, you know? So the top and bottom are letterboxed with the black bars on the top and bottom. Uh, and then the whole screen is just covered with dust and scratches, like it's an old 1950s, 1960s film. You know, it has that grainy, grainy feel to it, that, a little bit of a, a desaturated tint to it. Um, you know, you, you add a little bit of jokes here and there. Uh, end papers, so at the time, end papers were typically like nice patterns and, and solid colors back in the day, and I, I decided to uh, take the end papers uh, and add a little narrative leaning into the story so that you kind of get to cheat a little bit. You get to tell the story before you even get to the title page. Um, and so in this particular case, I took the robot, I made blueprints for what the girl might have possibly used uh, to build this robot. Now what was really adorable about this is that my son at the time, when he was about, he was about four years old, three years old, four years old, he took his Tinker Toys or Legos and then he actually used the robot hand 
as, as a template, and then he made the robot hand out of Tinker Toys just using these blueprints. I was, I was very uh, flattered by that. Now, you know, all the, all the jargon that I, I made up just, oh, just completely, completely fabricated. Uh, but it was just fun making this up, and Mac Barnett was fantastic about just kind of saying, just run with this, buddy. I don't know where this is going, but this is pretty cool. Um, also, the best part about it, um, Aaron, you mind if I borrow the book? Thank you very much. So one of my favorite parts of the book is uh, the dust jacket. When you take it off, it turns into this, into this movie poster that you can hang on the wall. So you take off the dust jacket here. So you have, you have this, but then you turn over the dust jacket and it turns into a movie poster that a kid can hang on the wall just to give that feeling of like a, a movie, a Japanese monster movie, right? Um, but then on top of that, I wanted the case cover to feel like a science notebook. And my lovely wife, she does cell research at Caltech. She's a very brainy person. Uh, so I took her science notebook and I scanned that. And so it is the girl's notebook. And so that is, oh no, or how my science project destroyed the world. Um, I poured so much love into it. It ended up winning a silver medal at the Society of Illustrators. And then I didn't have to worry about getting phone calls from editors and art directors ever again because I had just proven that I can uh, make a make a fun book, and so this is this is probably I would have to say this is probably like the first time people in publishing knew who I was. So I think that's why this is such an important book to me. Uh, are we there yet? Yay! Um, now this was an experiment about how to interact with a book. Okay, um, so for those of you who don't know, um, I wrote Beekle. And that book is a love letter to my oldest son. Uh, and the book is about, it's a metaphor about the day my son was born. And it's the anticipation of meeting this person for the first time and then discovering that you're perfect together, right? The name Beekle actually was my son's very first word for bicycle. We were at, a, we were at an intersection and my wife and I were I forgot we were heading to like Jimboree or something like that. And my, my son was strapped in the back seat and a man bikes through the intersection and then in the back seat we hear someone say, Beekle, and we look back and we said, are you trying to say something? And he points in a bicycle and he says, Beekle, and we realized he was trying to say bicycle. And so my wife said, that is an adorable word. You know, if you ever write a book, maybe Beekle would be a great name for a character. And so that's how Beekle came to be. Now, you have two kids you can't not write a book for your other kid or else they're going to have a horrible complex. <laughs> and so the darling thing about my youngest son, his name is Kyle, he, you know, he's young and he always looked up to his brother and he was always so anxious and, and excited. He wanted to grow up so fast so that he could do things with his brother. And there was this really adorable thing where he said, I can't wait till I'm nine so that when my brother is nine, we can play together. Like he just thought, he thought that his brother was just gonna stop aging and wait for him and be like, hey, we're both nine. <laughs> and, and as time went on, there was this adorable perception of time that I recognized about kids when they're going through, you know, the stages of growing up. And, you know, we would, we would do things like go to my grand, you know, like their grandparents' house. And it just felt like it was taking forever because there's nothing to do at my, my parents' house except like play with empty pill bottles, you know? <laughs> and like pull weeds. And so, you know, we'd be at my parents' house and, and the kids would be like, this is taking forever, you know? And, and you know, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a five, six hour day where we're just hanging out there, but oh, it feels like it's an eternity. You're so bored, time feels like it's slowing down. All right, but I take my kid to a party at Chuck E. Cheese, you know, and it's like, time to go. And they're like, what, what, we just got here. And it's like, no, we've actually been here for four hours and there's a lot of angry drunk dads around here, we gotta go. <laughs> and they're having so much fun, time just moves super quickly. It's this perception of time that, that kids and people have. And in this particular case, I wanted to write a story about a road trip because we all are familiar with that famous line, are we there yet? And so in this particular case, 
this, this kid is just so bored out of his mind and they're going to a birthday party. And it's dedicated my little son there and he's got his little paper crown there in the back. October, October 24th, 2016, um, that, is, that is the day he was born. And so I'm going to read it to you right now, like a portion of it, just so you can get an idea of what I mean in terms of the functionality of the book. <clears throat> the car trip to visit grandma is always exciting, but after the first hour, it can feel like an eternity. You might find yourself saying things like, are we there yet? Or this is taking forever. Staring out your window at a thousand miles of road can get boring pretty quickly. Not even all the toys in the world can help. But what happens when, now if you notice the word spacing is spreading out, I want you to slow down the reading of the book, right? And then, oh my gosh, what's this? Your brain becomes too bored. Now, if you follow that white line, you see that it ends with an arrow going the opposite direction. Now, if you've been interacting with the book, I've made you turn the book upside down, and that is for a very specific reason. I want you to go back in time. We're now turning the book backwards. Minutes begin to feel like hours. I'm bored. For those of you, any of you uh, familiar with the, the great author illustrator Brian Floca, who won a Caldecott Medal for Locom uh, Locomotive? So I reached out to Brian. I said, you're a master of trains. Would you by any chance have some train photos? And he said, give me, give me a couple minutes. <laughs> and a half hour later, he says, I have a folder full of trains for you to look at. And he gave me like 120 pictures of trains. <laughs> And he said, if you need any more, because he looked at the drawing of my train. I had done a train. He's like, that looks like a 442. Like, that, that wouldn't work. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. But I love that he sent me 120 photos. And he said, I have more if you need them. Minutes begin to feel like hours. I'm bored. Hours feel like days. I feel sick. Keep an eye on the monkey. Days become years. My butt hurts. <laughs> so here's a little thing. Top, top center, you see the woman in the white with the, with the, with the earmuff kind of hair thing? That's Princess Leia, because there's, there's princes and princes in the audience, so I put Princess Leia in there. My wife's name is Leah, so I take every opportunity to kind of just milk that in. <laughs> this will just be a quick trip, your parents promised. I have to go to the bathroom. Here's an interesting thing, and, and I don't know if you've ever heard me interviewed on a podcast, but here, 2BZK131, the license plate, 2BZK131, that has a significance, and every time you read or, or see a book that's illustrated by me, any opportunity I have to put a license plate on a car, it will be 2BZK131. 2BZK131 was a blue Jeep Cherokee that my parents had that we used to vacation in, and the car was a lemon. It broke down all the time. And I remember this one time we were taking a trip to Canada, and the Cherokee broke down. We live in Los Angeles. The car broke down in Bainbridge, Washington, just a half hour away from the border. And the car broke down, and we took it to a car garage, and, and the mechanic, it was on a Sunday, and the mechanic said, why don't you have why don't you have lunch in that diner, and then when you come back out, maybe I can figure this out. We have breakfast, we come back in, and the car is running, and my dad's just like, this is fantastic, you got the car to run, what did you do? And he says, well, these two wires in, in, the, in, the, in the trunk, in the, in, the, in the hood, they have to touch. So I found an old rusty metal, metal clothes hanger, and I <laughs> twisted the wires to, to make these two, metal, these two wires touch. Now. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the hood, I'm gonna close it on the wire hanger so that they will stay in contact. Your car should be okay, but never open the hood. <laughs> and my mother and father are just arguing. My dad's like, we're this close to Canada, we have to go to Canada. My mom's like, are you out of your mind? If we get lost in Canada, the car breaks down. Like, how are we gonna get back with no car? This is insane, we have to go back to LA. And they're just arguing back and forth. And as an only child, you have no one to, to yell at, you know? You just, so I just stood there staring at the license plate. 
2BZK131. <laughs> and that's like one of those little bits of useless knowledge that you have growing up that just doesn't leave your mind ever. And so I might as well use that as an Easter egg for all my future books. And so that next time you pick up another one of my book, you better believe I'm going to use 2BZK131 again. Anyway, this will just be a quick trip, your parents promised. I have to go to the bathroom. Roar! Now, here's something that you should notice is that the parents, they're aging. They're like, they're, their attire is changing throughout time. And the reason is because the little boy never actually looks outside of the car window. He's just so busy wallowing in his own misery that he doesn't have time to figure out what's going on outside. But here's the thing about people who complain is that they don't suffer. We all suffer because they're complaining. <laughs> and so they're suffering through this entire thing and the boy doesn't realize it until he snaps out of it. But it feels like it's been a million years. And he has his favorite toy, this toy dinosaur. And he looks out and he sees this dinosaur. It's his favorite thing. And so what ends up happening later on is he starts playing with the dinosaur. He starts appreciating being in the moment. And then he starts playing. And then, like I said, going to a birthday party, he's having so much fun that time starts moving forward again. And in this particular case, I get the reader to turn the book around over again just by him fetching a ball, and by the time the dinosaur brings back the ball, he's in like the Roman era, right? So here he is interacting with all these different moments at time. He's picking up Ben Franklin, Cleopatra, you know, Billy the Kid, and he has so much fun that he passes the present day, and he ends up in the future. He had so much fun, he passed the present day, ended up in the future, ends up at Grandma's house, which is 257 Kaplan Avenue. Uh, Kaplan uh, is named after my art director, David Kaplan. And, you know, he ends up in the future. You know it's the future because there's flying cars, but let's be honest, we're never going to have flying cars because we can't even drive on the ground correctly. Um, but it's a great way to just give the impression of this is the future, right? Everyone's always like, where are the flying cars? Uh, and that is, that, is, that is the inspiration. That's the idea and thinking behind uh, are we there yet. By the, time, by the time he gets to grandma's house, because he can only experience in the present day, um, you know, he, he, he learns to appreciate being in the moment. And that's really what I wanted my kid to take away from this experience. And this idea came from reading, you know, Japanese manga. Um, and I remember reading a, a, a translated Naruto comic to my son. And the whole time, you know, we're reading from right to left, you know. And the whole time he was saying, this feels like we're going backwards. And I remember thinking, how do I get to this point? And I realized I had to turn the book upside down and then right side up again. And so I sent a PDF. I sent a PDF to my, to my publisher, to my, to my art director and editor. And as a PDF, you're just scrolling up and down the pages. And, and they're, they're, they're asking me, why are, you, why are we turning the book upside down? And I'm saying, because you have to go back in time. And they're like, yeah, but what does that have to do with time travel? And then it wasn't until they actually made a mechanical version of the book and they actually interacted with it, then they realized, oh, I get this now. Right? Now, this was another interesting thing because when you're doing book uh, illustration, you tend to want, you're, 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 you're tending to want to illustrate towards the page turn. And so one of the notes that I got was, well, we, we should get the book to go towards the page turn. Can you flip the illustration so that the car is going the other way? Now, what ends up happening with that is that if you do that, you shift the narrative. Because now it feels like the car made a U-turn and you're going home. And that's not what you want. So what ends up happening is you leave it the way it is. And physically, you're going backwards. But narratively, you're, going, you're still going in a constant direction. So when you read this book, it's actually a little unsettling. But after five or six, and I remember, I remember, I remember my, my editor saying, like, what if they get lost, you know, when they turn the book upside down? And I said, it's a, it's a 50 page, it's a 44 page book. Like, I don't think they get lost for long, all right? They'll just look at the page and be like, oh, I have to go the other way. So that's, <laughs> that's are we there yet? Um, after the fall, so I, I think there's a lot of people that ask me what my favorite book is, and I think a lot of people assume that it's Beekle because it won this, it won the shiny gold sticker. Uh, but the truth is, my, my most precious work, my proudest work, is After the Fall, and I do believe that it is probably my, my best picture book work. Uh, and, and for those of you, this is a love letter to my lovely wife, who I met in college. 
Um, now, the thing about my lovely wife is that she has experienced an entire life of anxiety and depression, and she's had to deal with that for, for many, many years. Uh, and it got to a point where you know, it was affecting our marriage, and she realized that she had to go out and get treatment for it. And when she did, she became a completely different person. I mean, it, was, it, was, it wasn't helped because after our first child, she, she fell into a bout of uh, postpartum depression, which is not something that you really recognize until years later and you realize like, oh, that just happened. That was, that's what was going on. Um, and so I thought, I thought it would be great to write a story about that, but I didn't know how to, it was a big learning experience to me because at the time I didn't really understand uh, anxiety. You know, I was one of those guys that just said, well, why don't you just, you just get over it, let it go. And I realized like that's not something you can do. Um, and now the thing about Humpty Dumpty, sadly, if we talk about Humpty Dumpty as a symbol, the first thing that comes to mind is the fall. And so if I realized that by writing a book about Humpty Dumpty, and I never was a fan of that nursery rhyme, because it was just like, hey, here's an egg, he fell, the end. <laughs> you know, and I was like, that's, that's terrible, you know? <laughs> not, not, not realizing later on that, you know, the, the nursery rhyme was actually about an old giant cannon that was uh, on, a, on a wall in the little tiny town of Colchester. And what happened was that these royalists were coming to attack the city, and they shelled that wall so much that this giant cannon, Humpty Dumpty, got knocked off the wall, and it couldn't be put back up again because it was such a huge cannon. And then the city got sacked. That's where, that's where the origins of the Humpty Dumpty uh, nursery rhyme come from. Uh, but in this particular case, I kind of wanted to make you know, a third act for Humpty Dumpty, some place where he could be redeemed, uh, and kids could relate it into a way where they can think about maybe the time they fell off a bicycle or something like that, and, and it, it's overcoming these obstacles, and eventually, hopefully, becoming something more. And what do I mean by that? So the thing about people with anxiety is that you know, the, the best and easiest way to, to avoid you know, certain anxieties is just to avoid those triggers, right? So like my wife in, in particular, she wasn't a huge fan uh, of huge crowds. And so we just wouldn't go to like big sporting events or concerts and things like that. Like, you know, you, admit, you make adjustments in your life in order to, to get through life, right? And in this particular case, Humpty Dumpty gets put back together again. And as a joke, it's funny because um, my father's a doctor and I put Kings County Hospital because it was all the King's horses, all the King's men, thought I'd call it Kings County Hospital. Talked to my mom, my mom's like, oh, did you call it Kings County Hospital, you know, because your dad worked at Kings County Hospital? <laughs> I said, I, did, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. She's like, how did you not know that? You were a baby when we lived in Kings County. And I'm like, why would I know that? <laughs> she asks me some really stupid things. Like, remember when, Graham, like, remember when your uncle held you when you were an infant? Like, why would I remember that, <laughs> mom? You don't even remember what you had for lunch. Anyway, so let's just pretend that Humpty Dumpty got put back together again. There are emotional scars that are left over, the trauma of falling, the fear of falling again. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's reminded by the ladder, you know, the ladder that he climbed to get back up the wall. So um, clearly he lives, you know, he sleeps in a bunk bed, but he decides to sleep on the floor. Again, with the ladder, rather than climbing up that ladder to get the fun cereals, he would rather get the awful cereals on the bottom for those of you who are inquiring, my favorite one is Sad Clown. Sad Clown is my favorite. Um, now here's a little Easter egg. So if you look at, if you look at Crunch Tiger, the, the, the cost of the cereal is $9.29. And, there, and there's a very specific reason for that. It's because uh, we go to Kauai every summer and we go to this darling, we go to this darling little grocery store called Big Save. And of course, as you all know, you have to import food there and it's very expensive. We want, my wife was dying for a bowl of of, of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, it was $9.29. And I said, you can, you can go without Frosted Flakes for a week and a half. She's like, no, I can't. $9.29. That's what everybody says, yeah, yeah, it's like their favorite. Now, that's just... <laughs> That's just, that's just, and as you can see, I'm using color to try to make it very unappealing on the bottom. 
but I'm at an age now where, yeah, I'd pick up a bag of flax. <laughs> Grown up food. Um, but he keeps, he keeps walking by, he keeps walking by that wall. He longs to go back up on that wall. Here's a little subtle thing that a lot of people don't notice. Um, you know, the life of the wall actually is interacted by the seasons, but it also reflects his, his, his mood, his personality. So this is during the fall and all the leaves have died and they're falling off uh, the vines. Um, and, then, and then here, very, very subtle thing. He's walking along the shadow of the wall so that his shadow can stand on top of it. Very, very subtle things, okay? Um, but he hits rock bottom, you know? He's a bird watcher, but he's settled for watching birds on the ground. And at this point, he's hit rock bottom, it's winter, everything's completely monotone. Uh, he sees a paper airplane, builds a paper airplane, you know? But, but the twist is that he turns it into this beautiful gold bird. If you go on YouTube, you can actually make this paper airplane. It's an actual thing. Um, and of course, he recklessly decides, let's try this paper airplane out right next to the wall. <laughs> now, in, in this particular case, you know, the wall, the wall itself plays a character because as you're turning the pages, you see, his, you see his figure getting enveloped by the shadow. It's still this thing that's looming over him. It's, 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 this, it's this beast that he has to still overcome. You know, and he sees this, he sees this paper airplane uh, heading towards this wall and he has to make a decision. He has to make a decision whether he's gonna overcome this obstacle, and here he is just in the darkness, and he has to come to the light. And so he slowly climbs his way out, you know, inch by inch, step by step. Uh, the number 12, um, that, is, that was the number of years that my wife and I were married uh, when, I, when I made this book. Um, just little gestures showing showing anxiety and fear without having to overly state it, right? The shaky hand. There was one spread that wasn't published, but there was this one where he starts, he starts climbing up the ladder, but with this other foot, he's checking to make sure that the ground is still there, because that's, that's something we all do, right? Like, is it, yeah, it's still there. Like the, like the earth moved in you know, the fraction of the seconds that you were climbing up. And it's, it's taking place, yeah, it's taking place in the spring, so you can see that the vines are starting to come back to life again. Um, you know, the wall is also patches of metal and, and, and wood, just all these different things. And he comes, out of the, he comes out of the darkness into the light. He's overcome, you know, this, this struggle. But it, it doesn't end there. He becomes more. He starts cracking. He starts, he starts cracking, and little, little bits of feather starts coming out, and he starts hatching even more. This is the only wordless spread in the book. And I always like, when I read it to kids, I always take a moment, I leave it at the spread, and I just pause. And I love to just hear an auditorium of kids just gasp. And if you wait long enough, it happens. You're like, there it is. You know? And then he, he spring, you know, spreads his wings and turns into a bird and flies away. Because he becomes something more. He overcomes this anxiety. And the thing about my wife was that when she got, when she got help, when she got treatment, she managed to continue her life. And so when I knew her in college, she was an avid tennis player. She loved tennis. And then once we got married and we had kids, she stopped all of that. It was like she put her life on hold. And, and it wasn't until she got medication and then, and then got her head straight that she started taking tennis again. She found her passion again. She started becoming more than what she was. She moved on with her life, right? And so as a result, like, you know, I, I, uh, I, I now made it a goal in my life to take her to like each of the grand slams of tennis. Like I wanna take her to each one. So, you know, we, you know, I took her to the US Open in uh, 2019, which was an amazing, we didn't even realize that it was gonna be Serena Williams last time in a grand, grand slam. It turned out to be this beautiful thing. Uh, this year, my wife and I are celebrating our 20th anniversary. I was gonna take her, I was gonna take her to the French Open. In, in Paris, but we have two boys, and they were like, ugh, Paris. What's there to do in Paris? And we're like, go to your room till you love Paris. <laughs> like, how dare you not like Paris? You don't even know what's there. And it's like, easily one of the top five cities in the entire world, and you're complaining about Paris. Go to your room. <laughs> anyway, we're going to Japan, anyway, but. Um, but yeah, so that's, 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 
that's the story behind it. Uh, little Easter egg, between, between the wings, you see this building, you see the name Tager. That's her maiden name. That's her maiden name. Um, she, she, took, she, took the, she took the last name Santat uh, when we got married. She wasn't sure if she wanted to take the name Santat, and I left it to her. I was like, yeah, do as you will, but uh, let me just say, just buy while the stock's low. Uh, so, yeah, she's, she, she's a Santat, but I honored, I honored her family with the last name Tager. Uh, and she was so deeply touched, she was so deeply touched by it. She got a tattoo of a bird feather on her back, and I have a, I have a lovely tattoo of a bird feather on my arm, you know? And so, um, as, a, as a rule, I think we have to be married together forever. I think that's how marriage works, because we, we have the same tattoo. Uh, um, the Aquanaut, this is a graphic novel that I came out with last year. Uh, this is a project that I worked on for 11 years, and it wasn't because uh, graphic novels are big daunting projects, which they are, but uh, I was just so busy with so many other projects that this just kept getting shoved aside. Um, now I think, I think I have a thing called thalassophobia, which you know is the, is the persistence and intense fear of deep bodies of water. I'm a horrible swimmer. I mean, I don't, I don't swim very much, but like, you know that scene in um, Finding Nemo when, when Nemo's at the edge of the reef and he just looks out into that deep, dark blue ocean? Like, I would, I would die. I don't, for some reason, I'm thinking like a shark's gonna come out of there or something. Like, I would rather die in space, alone in space, than in the sea because in space, there's nothing that can nibble at your feet. Like, I would rather just, <laughs> This is how I go, you know, but yeah, the water, terrifying, right? And I think part of it is lent by this traumatic experience I had when I was five and my parents took me to the Natural History Museum in New York and I saw this. <laughs> and I freaked out. I remember going in that room, I, I literally got out of my stroller and I was just like, I don't care where I'm going, but just not this room. <laughs> Because it was this feeling like, oh my gosh, there are monsters. Like, I only saw Godzilla movies, but I didn't realize there were like giant kaiju in the bottom of the sea, you know? So this was something where I was just like, I do not want to be anywhere near these things. So much so that I didn't even want to like touch the foam of the water at a beach. Like, I didn't even want to step in the water because I was afraid like some squid would just come out like, you're mine now, right? And so, yeah, I just had, and it didn't help that I would go <laughs> look in library books about Spanish galleons being attacked by giant kraken and I'm like, I would never go on a cruise because I don't want to be like at the buffet line on the Queen Mary and then something's just like, no, you're mine. Like it would just be a nightmare, you know? And then of course it didn't help that I'm watching like Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which I don't know, there was, there started, as I got older, there was this fascination of like, wait a sec, there's monsters in the sea. Like that's kind of cool. I kind of want to know more. And I would go to museums and I'd look at these old diving suits. And you know, this is one of the first diving suits. It was made out of metal. It looked like a big robot, you know? And then and then you'd see the old ones here that don't look any different from, you know, astronaut spacesuits, but but they're just in better colors, like it was designed by Christian Dior or something like that, <laughs> right? Now here's here's the thing that really got me thinking. Um, so so if you've ever been in Southern California or San Diego, there's a place called SeaWorld, right, where they just exploit these orcas and dolphins and be like, hey, jump out of this water for a mackerel or something like that, right? But back in the 1980s and 90s, uh, if you didn't have the time or money to go to SeaWorld, there was this knockoff place called Marine Land of the Pacific in Palos Verdes, California, which was just a half hour drive out of LA. Now, here's a picture that I took at Marine Land. Now look how, look how like sketchy this place is, right? They don't even have like stands or anything like that. It's just people standing around this pool like, look at these whales. And, and the crazy part is that when you, when you study, or even when these guys are talking about whales, they go, oh, they migrate for thousands and thousands of miles. And here this orca is in this pool that probably could fit in your backyard, right? And, it, and I thought, like, this is like someone telling me that I have to live in my bathtub for the rest of my life. This is horrible, right? And so the other part of it was that, like, everything was just dilapidated, kind of running, you know, worry, you know, wearing down and things like that. I would go by certain exhibits, like, and they would do a demonstration on, like, schools of fish, and you would just have these fish, like, swimming around in this tank. But then you'd have, like, one or two dead fish just, like, floating on the top, and I'm just thinking, like, oh, my God, this place isn't okay, right? And so the thing about Marineland that, that, I, that, I, that I found out from a friend uh, was that 
it wasn't created by marine biologists or you know like an oceanographer or like some biology or like marine company or anything like that. It was created by two animators by the name of William Hanna and Joseph Barbera. <laughs> Hanna Barbera. Two animators, and they just thought, you know it would be great if we made a knockoff SeaWorld and then we could just put Scooby-Doo and sell T-shirts to make money for the animation company, right? And it was this whole, and they didn't even care who they hired. They're like, yeah, you want to work with some orcas? Then you're hired. And they would just bring in all these people that had absolutely no idea what they were doing. And, you know, like, I think like 25, 30 years later, the place closed. And it was just left out there in the Palos Verdes. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, and here's where the, the story for the Aquanaut started coming to fruition, right? Now, when I was on the replacements, I had an art director who used to work at, at Hanna-Barbera, and I asked him, I said, um, do you ever know what happened to all the fish and sea life at Marineland after that place closed? And he said, oh, yes, you're not going to like what you have to hear but uh, this wasn't even really publicized, but it, I, I only know this because William Hanna told me. And he said, when the park closed, they still had a lot of debts that they had to pay to all these banks. And as a result, they had to sell everything off to pay back the banks. They sold off the deep fryers, they sold off like the, like the, the chairs and the tables and all kinds of things. They sold off the orcas to SeaWorld in San Diego, the dolphins to another marine park in North Carolina. But then you had all these other little fish. You know, you had your like, you had your like, your, your, your lionfish, starfish, eels, jellyfish, just in all these different exhibits. But they couldn't just like release them back out into the ocean. They wanted to make their money back, so they wanted to try find maybe some kind of uh, aquarium or somewhere in the country that would just buy them back. So this is what they did. They got 12 water tankers, drove them all the way up to marine land, and without even thinking about separating the fish, they just took them all, put them all in these 12 tanks, and they waited for a buyer. Weeks went by, months went by, then it was Christmas, they just left the tankers out there, and when they came back after the New Year's, they came back to 12 tankers filled with dead fish. It was horrible. And we, I remember by the time he was done with this story, I remember my entire staff was like, our jaws open like, God, I can't believe that that happened. And I remember thinking to myself, what if they could have taken it upon them, like I wish that like the sea life could take it upon themselves to make a great escape somehow. And that's where the seed for the Aquanaut came to be. You know, of course there's other inspirations like Jacques Cousteau and things like that. And then, uh, you know, I was a big Star Trek nerd. Uh, so I like the idea of a big space, space crew or something, you know, exploring the galaxy. And so the idea of the Aquanaut was these sea creatures that have to deliver this message in a bottle, but they have to go to a place where they, they can't exist, a place that's absent of water, a place that they call space. And so they take an old diving suit and they gut the machine parts from a submarine and they, they turn it into a land walking device and they try to blend in and pretend they're human beings walking on land, trying to find this place called Aqualand. And then when they get there, they realize it's not this safe marine reserve that they had expected, but it's this place where sea creatures are exploited and they don't like that and so they try to make an escape. Uh, but it also is a case where they meet this little girl who is the daughter of this captain who died on this ship. And um, you know, so the thing about this story that I wrote 11 years ago was it's my perception of loss. It's just the perception of how I think it would feel like to lose somebody. And then towards the last two years of my project, the last year, year and a half of this project, my father dies of liver cancer. And it was suddenly at a point where I realized this is what it feels like to lose somebody. And so while I was inking the story, I thought about the character and how I could inject the feelings that I had into the character. And so my father, my father was a, he was a, he was a huge, he was a huge wine drinker. Like he loved collecting wines and he had this giant, he had this giant wine refrigerator, had over easily 600 bottles of wine. And I remember, I remember on his, I remember on his deathbed, this was probably two weeks before he died you know, he said to me, the wine collection is yours. And I said, Dad, I don't drink wine. And, he, and, and I said, but I wanted him to savor what he had invested in all these years. And I said, why don't we enjoy one glass of wine together? Get your most expensive bottle and let's, let's drink it up so that you know what you bought. 
just, just so you know what you bought? And I remember he said, no, it's fine, it's yours. And I couldn't sit with that very well, right? And so I remember his friends coming over wanting to pay their respects. And before they came into the house, I said, hey, why don't we, can you by any chance help me out and convince my father to have one glass glass of wine? And they said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And they go in there and they all just coax him like, come on, one, one glass of wine for the road. You know, and, and, and my dad says, yeah, sure. Okay, let's do it. He says, go to that fridge over there. Cause he had like three wine fridges. You have no idea what my parents' electric bill was like to run these things, it was crazy. <laughs> and I know nothing about wine and I go inside, I go inside, I'm picking, I'm looking at all the bottles and I do know like, well, the older the wine, the better it must be, right? And so I'm looking around and I, and I know that my dad always bragged about this brand of bottle called Opus One, which is like a very, I didn't realize it was such a very well-known a bottle of wine, the oldest bottle he had, 1995. And I pull that out from the back and I show it to all my dad, my dad and all his friends. The whole room just goes, oh. <laughs> and my dad says that's a 1500 bottle, $1, $1,500 bottle of wine. I said, we better drink every sip of this. <laughs> and I remember taking out all the glasses and we poured a glass of wine and it was this moment in time. Now my father, he was a doctor and he was always really self-conscious about his health. Like he ate bland foods because he just wanted to like live for every last minute and he was just convinced that he was gonna die of cardiovascular disease. And the whole time it's like he's staring at this door of life and he's just waiting for, for like a stroke to come through the door like I'm here to get you, right? And then just gets a tap on the shoulder and it's liver cancer. And he, it was just, it was crazy because like I hadn't seen my father in a year because of the pandemic. And then the first thing he says to me, like when I when I when I when he asks me to come, is that he has liver cancer, and it spread to his it spread to his 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 jaw, it spread to his liver, like it was just like it was all over the place. And I remember my mom being really upset because she's a breast cancer survivor, and she was upset that he wasn't fighting it. My dad said it's liver cancer, like there's no way to fight it, you know. And he he chose hospice. And I I was thinking maybe I was going to have two or three months with him, but I only had I only had three weeks. It moves so quickly. And so this moment here where we had this bottle of wine, you know, and he's drinking the wine. And I remember he was just staring at the bottle of wine and I heard him say, this was a good life. And I was glad that I could bring that to him. I'm, I'm glad I could have that last moment with him because we had a rocky relationship for a number of years because he was just so insistent that I be a doctor, right? And I was always just very like, why can't you just be happy that I'm an artist, a successful artist, right? And he was just always like, I don't know if it's an Asian thing or if it's a generational thing, but it was always like, I need you to do more, more, more. And you know, like it was always just such a big conflict with us. But for the last three weeks that we had together, it was magical. And I never thought we'd ever get to that point in our lives, right? And I got to share, I was so proud, I'm so glad that I got to share that last bottle of wine with him. And so you put it in the book. Right? Bottles, a message in a bottle. And I dedicated that book to my father. And we just celebrated, what, two years, two years of his passing. You know, my mother, my mother now lives alone. And there's a part, I mean, she misses him every day. But, you know, each day gets easier and easier. And that's the Aquanaut. And so the last book I'm going to talk about is my memoir, A First Time for Everything. Um, I was working on a different memo a memoir. It was a story about my parents. Um, and then my 13-year-old son came to me one day and asked me about the first time I fell in love. And I thought for a minute and I said, I was 13 years old and I went to trip to Europe and I met this girl from St. Louis. You know, and I was very insecure. Uh, I didn't really like myself a whole lot because I, I had just finished eighth grade. I had just gone through middle school. And for those of you who have gone through junior high, middle school, it's awful, right? Like it's <laughs> terrible. Universally, universally it's terrible, you know? And, I, and for those of you who are not yet in middle school, like, ignore what I'm saying. It's, it's, <laughs> it's absolute delight, right? But I, I'm here to tell you that, that the first 18 years of your life, going through high school, like, we all go through this, but once you get past that portion of life, everything gets better. You go out there, you realize how beautiful the world is. You have, you have a, a, a niche of people that you will meet that will be your soulmates for the rest of your life. You have common interests and, and common personalities. Um, 
And you don't have to be defined by this one little town you grew up in. I grew up in a very you know, white conservative agricultural land and I was like one of the only Thai kids in town. You know? And imagine growing up you know, in the 1980s you know, where everyone was just making long duck dong jokes. And then also a movie called Karate Kid comes out and your name happens to be Daniel. You know, just miserable, right? So I remember going online and seeing this poll. It's not a huge sample, but the disparity in, in, the, in the statistics just were resounding. And I said, if the world ends tomorrow, would you be happy with the way you lived? Almost 70% of people said no, which I find really sad. You know, like we're, we're on this planet and we're just kind of like sleeping through life, not really living life to its fullest. That's kind of the impression that I'm getting, or we've made mistakes and we just wallow in those mistakes. I'm gonna tell you about one of the worst mistakes that I made in my life. <laughs> it was 2019 and I took my kids to this fishing hole out in Waimea Canyon in Hawaii. And it's like, imagine the Grand Canyon just filled with luscious green vines and plants and stuff like that. Um, and, it's, and what I found out, it's one of the top five darkest places on the planet because there's just no light anywhere because you're in the middle of the Pacific, right? Now, <laughs> we're trying to get, I had this horrible Chrysler minivan. We were trying to get back out and the road was so muddy because they just don't pave their roads, we couldn't get the car up this hill to get back onto the main road. And, and everyone, all the locals said, well, just go down that, that jungle down there. Make two rights and a left, you'll get back on the main road. My wife and kids, like I was just thinking like, oh, they're gonna stick with me. No, they got out of that car. We're like, we'll see you at the main road. And it was me, my father-in-law, my best friend. We, we, <laughs> we drove into that jungle trying to figure out what constituted as two lefts and a right, and a half hour later, we got stuck in the mud. And it was, clearly, it was so bad, we could not get anywhere, so we got all our supplies, we got out, and we just started walking. We walked for two hours, and we get to the edge of the island, and I'm facing the Pacific Ocean from a cliff, and I realize, oh, I think we made a wrong turn. <laughs> We, we walked, we walked for, we walked for seven hours. We walked 17 miles, almost 42,000 steps. My father-in-law is 76 and he takes heart medication. He should not be walking 17 miles. Now here's the thing, we're walking and it's so dark, I have, my, I have my iPhone flashlight on, I have it on, and it's so dark, I can't see past the screen because the darkness is just swallowing up all the light. And then I look up at the stars and I see this. With my naked eye, my, my friend, he had, a, he had a really nice camera, took a long exposure. You could see the Milky Way galaxy with your eyes. That was how dark it was, and it was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen of the sky. And I remember thinking to myself, despite all this miser misery that we've gone through, I would do it again just to experience this. So, in my memoir, I have this horrible experience in junior high. Of all the times in my life I got to have a miserable experience, this was the worst. So, I don't know if you guys remember Nancy Reagan's Say No to Drugs campaign, where they got reformed drug addicts to come to school to tell kids everything about drugs, and then say, don't do drugs. We had 15 minutes left of school and the principal wouldn't let us go, and I had this speech teacher by the name of Marilyn Bjork, and she says, Mr. Santat, I think it'd be a great idea if you went to the front of the class and the entire school and did a speech, performed a speech in front of all the kids so that you could prepare for the speech tournament this weekend. And I said, no, woman, are you out of your mind? They're going to cut me alive. She said, nonsense. All you have to do is enunciate. <laughs> and I went out there and she grabbed the microphone and I got heckled, I got destroyed. And it was after that day, all the kids said, do not hang out with Dan Santat. He is that loser that died in front of the entire school, the entire school. You guys all have that nightmare where everyone at school is laughing at you because you did something embarrassing. I lived it. I lived it. How does someone recover from something like that? My mother thought it would be a good idea if I got out of town. 
So she signed me up for this three-week trip to Europe. I don't know if anybody's familiar with EF Tours. Has anyone heard of EF Tours? EF Tours is still in business today. It's a fantastic tour group thing if you want to study international abroad. Um, and so it was me on a bus full of all the popular girls from junior high. Like these girls were like really cool and they would always just like pick on me. You know, I was, I was, <laughs> I was the dork in school and now I'm on a bus with all the popular girls. And then we paired up with another group of kids from St. Louis. So I want you to see me right there wearing that Wimbledon shirt uh, on the left. And then I want you to pay attention to this girl right dead center in the middle wearing the black shirt short blonde hair in the second row on the top. That, her name is Amy. So she is, this, she is this lovely girl who was on the trip, who they eventually found out, you know, all the whispering and all the muttering on the bus was that this girl Amy from St. Louis thought I was kind of cute. And what happens here is that I'm on a bus full of popular girls and I learned that there's three type of people in this world, there's three type of personalities that each kid has. The first one is that kid that acts a certain way around their parents and grandparents. They're very nice, they're very proper. Hi, Grandma, let me give you a hug, Grandma, right? Can I, can I get your plate, Grandma? Can I, can I pull you up a nice spot of tea, Grandma? <laughs> then there's that second kid who's at school, who before you get in the car to go to school, you're on the, you know, you're on the internet looking up filthy jokes that you would never tell Grandma, but you can't wait to share with your friends on the playground. Like, oh, let me tell you, there's this, there's this story, uh, you know, it's like this horrible joke that I could never tell my grandma, right? That's the second kid. Peer pressure everywhere. You have to act a certain way or else you're going to, you, you know, you want to be invisible. You don't want to, like, stand out in the crowd. Then there's that third kid who's out somewhere all alone, thinks nobody's watching them, isn't surrounded by peer pressure, isn't surrounded by the judgment of, you know, their friends and, and family. That's the real you. And in this particular case, we're on the other side of the planet, and suddenly these girls who were really popular, they didn't have to worry about the pressures of junior high and being seen around other people. They became like these wonderful angels who were just like, oh honey, this girl likes you, and like she's already way out of your league. And you have absolutely no idea what you're doing, but we're totally gonna help you because you're gonna blow this so hard. And so I became like their summer project. It's like straight out of a John Hughes film, right? Now the crazy thing about being a kid in the 1980s, latchkey kids, for those of you kids out there, I want you to look at your parents because the way your parents were raised by your grandparents, their parents, was, hey, go outside, I don't wanna see your face till the sun comes down. That was parenting back in the day. And we were called latchkey kids because they would take the house key and you put a string around your neck like a dog and just, oh, I need to get back in the house, mm, thank you, right? That was parenting back then. <laughs> so you wouldn't be surprised that when you go on a tour, you would get on a tour bus from eight to noon, and you would drive around Paris and see the city, oh, lovely city, Paris, right? And then from noon to one, you would have lunch, but then from one to five, they would say, all right, kids, have fun in Paris. <laughs> Meet us at the Eiffel Tower at five. And I remember being a kid thinking, are you out of your mind? Like, I'm 13 years old, I don't think this is a good idea. <laughs> and Marilyn Bjork, that woman that made me speak in front of all those kids in that gym, she was a chaperone of the trip. And she said, Mr. Santat, the Eiffel Tower is the tallest monument in all of Paris. Wherever you are, you will be able to see it. I trust that you will be able to get yourself there by five o'clock. And it was one of those little simple things where I pushed my boundaries a little bit and I realized that I was capable of more and that I was worth more than I, I thought of myself. Because when you live in a small town and everyone's calling you a loser, you think you're a loser because you have no life experience to base that off of. And so if everyone's calling you a loser, you're thinking, well, this whole town can't be wrong. I must be a loser, right? But the beautiful thing about it is that you go out into this world, we have a planet of what, eight billion people? You're gonna find someone who speaks your language, who is just on your level and becomes your best friend or whatever. And you know, maybe it's not the town that you live in, maybe it's somewhere else, but there are people out there who, who, can, who can be your best friend. So I did, I've managed to find my way to the Eiffel Tower. The legal drinking age in Germany is 14. I was at the Hofbräuhaus. house, I was 13 and three quarters. <laughs> I decided to sneak a little 
sip of beer for myself. It was disgusting. <laughs> I stayed in Salzburg with, with these two French girls and these two Danish girls. French girls smoke like chimneys. And I remember I met these two girls, I met these two girls, and they had been smoking since they were 11. Like, yeah, and, and I said, oh, what's the big deal with smoking? Tried a cigarette, it was disgusting. I wouldn't recommend it. And I know, listen, this is the funny thing, is that we as parents, you know, we're very protective of, of our kids, and, and I, I, find it, I find it silly that we grew up in a generation where we would just let, let loose like monsters. And now we're just constantly like, don't do that, don't touch that, don't do this, right? You're texting your kid, where are you? What time are you gonna be home? The world's dangerous, don't go there, don't touch that, right? <laughs> and we were let loose, we did whatever we wanted to, right? And there's this other thing that I think we do is that we're in denial of a lot of things, right? You, you know, you, you say, oh my gosh, like, oh, I don't want you to drink alcohol. What were you thinking when you were 13, right? You were curious about these things, and yet we deny ourselves those truths to our kids. You know, we're like, oh, worry about that later on. As if it wasn't there, you just sweep it under the rug, as if it's something that they're not curious about. And I just say, you know what? I think we're doing a disservice by hovering over our kids and not challenging them enough and letting them figure out who they are as people. I think that's, I think that's unfair, right? And so with my kids, I realized that if they make mistakes, that's probably a quicker and better way for them to learn than for me to be like, don't do this, don't touch that, you know? I went to a nightclub. I went to a German discotheque. <laughs> you had to be 18 to go in that German discotheque. I was 13 and three quarters. <laughs> and of course, back in the 1980s, they just let you in. They didn't check any ID. They just said, well, you're with these two 18-year-old girls from Denmark. I can't imagine they'd be hanging out with some 13-year-old dork from Los Angeles. So I go into this nightclub. And of course, Amy is there. And then that was like the first time. And that's the thing. These, these popular girls, these girls from France and Denmark, they just took me under their wing and they said, oh my gosh, you're totally gonna blow it. And they helped me get to know this girl. They pulled her onto the dance floor with me, we got to dance, they told me to walk her home. I walked her home. I got lost in Salzburg in the middle of the night, just running into the darkness at 1 a.m. to a point where I had to steal a bike. And the crazy thing about Europe is that no one locks their bikes. There's just this beautiful honor system where it's like, yeah, this is my bike. No one takes a bike. Danke schön. <laughs> Except this dumb 13-year-old tourist comes in and it's like, I need this bike. You know, you're a sucker for not locking it, right? And I get chased by these four German punks who look at me and, and I'm thinking like, they're not wrong. I'm, I'm stealing a bike here. <laughs> they're doing this beautiful service for the community <laughs> to beat up this 13-year-old kid. The biggest, the biggest, most amazing thing, I snuck into Wimbledon. I snuck into Wimbledon, and this was towards the end of the trip, so I built this certain confidence where I, I, I was aware of how to navigate around a city. It changes that much in three weeks. You're in Paris, and you're thinking like, I don't know how to travel around a city. By the end of that trip, I just said, okay, where am I? Where's the public transit system? How do I get to Wimbledon? That's how much a person can change in three weeks, but you have to give your kids that permission. You have to give them that freedom to learn who they are as people, and you're going to thank yourself for doing that, right? So I got to Wimbledon. And I got it, I snuck into center court. Here's an actual picture of center court. It was a rain delay, it went on for five hours and I just sat there, just taking in the vibe, not thinking that I was ever going to ever sit in a place like this, right? And then they take the rain tarp off and then the sideline judges come out, the chair umpire comes out. John McEnroe and Stefan Edberg come out and I watched the third set of the 1989 men's semifinal for three pounds. And that's just by going out and going on an adventure. And the liberties of being a kid, where if you get caught for doing something, they're like, well, you're a kid, just get out of here. I don't want to see your face ever again, <laughs> like your parents. <laughs> and I remember the first time I told a girl that I liked her. It was on a playground. And we were really good friends and all my friends said, hey, you should ask that girl to be your, your girlfriend because you guys are best friends. We think you'd be a cute couple. And I remember going up to my friend and saying, hey, would you like to be my girlfriend? She goes, ew, no. <laughs> and my friends are shocked. They're just like, why? And she says, cause he's ugly to my face. <laughs> that is horribly scarring. And that is something that you just carry on for years. Even with my wife, I'm like, you probably don't want to date me because I'm so hideous. 
Yeah. But if you open up your heart to somebody, it can be magical. And the time comes at the right time, you know? No rush. Maybe you see these kids, you know, like rushing into relationships. I have a girlfriend, and it's like, nah, eh, that doesn't really count, like hanging out in the monkey bars. That's not a thing, right? That's cute. And the thing about going on a three-week trip is that you know it's going to end, so then you're asking yourself, like, why am I putting my heart out to somebody that I know it's going to end, right? And so this three-week trip ends, and then we become pen pals. And she sends me, my camera broke during the trip, so I didn't have any photos. This is the only photo I have of her. Yeah. And we wrote to each other for six years. We became very good pen pals. And then this thing comes around in 2009 called Facebook. <laughs> and I get this message, and it says, Dan, not sure from your profile pic, are you the Dan who went to Europe circa 1989, 90-ish? And those butterflies come back? And you're like, oh my gosh said, holy smokes, well, if it isn't the very first girl I ever kissed. <laughs> and then you have to tell her, I'm making a memoir. <laughs> and she ends up being really flattered. She says, oh, my kids know who you are. They know your cartoon show. They've read all your books. But they have absolutely no idea that I was your first kiss. And I said, is that OK? Is that weird? And she says, I'm flattered. And she gave me her journal. And she transcribed you know, the name of hotels that we stayed at, the foods we ate, what the weather was like. For a 13-year-old girl, this girl was very thorough. <laughs> it was amazing. Sent photos of us that I had never seen before. It was, it was great. It was a great resource. And then you think about the other people on the trip. One of the people on the trip is this popular girl. Her name was Joy. And she said, she messaged me out of the blue. She said, I still have a dragon you drew back in high school, framed, of course. You've always been an incredible artist. And I didn't remember that. I said, Joy, what are you talking about? What dragon? And she said, I bought, I bought a drawing of a dragon from you for my father for, for his birthday. And I thought about it, and I said, I don't know what dragon you're talking about. She's like, here, let me show you. And she takes a picture of it and framed. It's hanging on the wall. She says, I still have it. And then suddenly, it just pops in my mind. I said, oh my gosh, that's the first drawing I'd ever sold in my life to anybody. And I sold it for 20 bucks. And 20 bucks back then was like, what? I'm buying so many boxes of nerds, you know? <laughs> and then you realize, like, that has to be in the story. Because it's a story about firsts, first, first experiences of all kinds. And so let me tell you about being under those stars. If I got in a time machine and I could go back to 1989 and I could stand outside of that gym and stop 13-year-old Dan from going in there and, and, and doing that speech, being like, dude, no, you don't want to go in there. You're going to die today. I wouldn't take that away because it's about how you, how you live with these experiences. Because if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have gone to Europe. I wouldn't have met Amy. I wouldn't have gone to art school. I wouldn't have become an author. I wouldn't have made this book. So I would never trade this experience, this, the most painful experience in my life. I would never trade it for the world. But that's how, you, that's how you live. You'll be lucky to live a life where you just live spot free. But there's no point in trying to live your life being terrified that something bad's going to happen to you. Like, that's not living. You take the good with the bad, and you just roll with those punches. But really, life is a self-discovery of who you are and liking yourself as a person. And that took a long time for me to figure out. I really didn't start liking myself, honestly, till my mid-30s. And then you think about these obstacles. You say, well, you know, if I, can ex if I can survive this, I can survive anything. I can speak, you know, in front of 10,000 kids at a commencement speech, you know. I could speak to a room of 50 people doing a lecture. Because I know what it's like to die in front of 800 kids in a middle school. And now here's the last thing I'm going to part with you people, is that we've been so busy. We've gone through a pandemic, right? And, and I think there's a lot of a fair share of emotional scars that are going out that we're not very well aware that we have, or, or maybe we have, like my son, my oldest son, he just, you know, he went through a bout of depression. We had to, you know, get help for him. But... We as adults, I feel, are just totally blowing it. Because even after a pandemic, where you can't even convince half the people to wear a mask, you know? And right after the pandemic, we're just starting to yell at each other about politics. We can't even figure out climate control, you know? 
and things like that, and yet we have the nerve to tell our kids what's right and wrong when we can barely figure it out. I know we as parents here in this audience, we're, we're faking it. We're like trying to feel like, I have a 17 and a 14 year old kid and I'm like, I think this is how we apply for college these days. I, I don't even know how to do my taxes, <laughs> right? And it's okay to tell your kids that you're not perfect because I feel like there's this position that we feel like we have to maintain this control so they don't worry. But I think with our kids, if we show them that we're human and that we make mistakes, they're gonna connect with us a lot better. So, I mean, my parting words is like, parents, back off a little bit. Your kids are smarter than, than you realize, and I think they're more capable of things than you will understand. And for the kids out there, okay, your summer end, you know, your, your school year ended, you're going on a summer, I'm not telling you to go to Europe. <laughs> but little experiences make all the difference in the world. Try something out of your comfort zone a little bit. You know, we have this survival instinct where, you know, back in, back in the primitive days, you know, we would understand not to do something because a saber-toothed tiger might come and eat us, right? But we don't have those concerns anymore about fear and, and you know, and, and things like that, danger. But now we go to the ice cream place and we get the same flavor of ice cream every time because we're afraid that if we try something new, we're going to be disappointed. That, that's an innate instinct that we have as human beings, but now it's just... I don't like this flavor of ice cream. I might be sad. Okay? <laughs> Try that different flavor. You might like it. You might learn something from this experience. You might realize, oh my gosh, I actually do like coconut. Or you could do the same flavors and be that 70% of people that regretted not living their life to the fullest. And the last thing I want to say for you kids who just survived the pandemic, is that if you went through a pandemic, you can get through anything. And I don't think we as adults have told you guys that once you get through this point in life, it's going to be a lot easier, okay? And it's going to be a lot brighter and that you're all going to be okay. Thank you very much. I went a little over my time, I'm sorry. Um, and also, Dan will be having a signing in the front lobby on the first floor from 145 to 245. So you can come see him again down there. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.